Good morning, everybody. Today we'll be looking at the introduction to strategic financial management and the rules of financial managers. The subtopic under the introductory aspect of this course, which include the following. We'll be discussing on the definition of strategic financial management. We are going to take a look at the strategic planning process, the roles of financial managers, objectives, stakeholders and agency theory, identifying stakeholders and their expectations, and also corporate social responsibility. So lastly, we will also be looking at ethical issues in strategic financial management. I believe most of us have watched the pre-recorded video, the previous class. So part of what we are going to be looking at here is that we'll be giving further explanation to all the identified subtopics here. And there will be room for questions and answers as the class is starting immediately now. Introduction to Strategic Financial Management. We are talking about strategies. This has to do with identification of long-term goal or objectives. And looking towards the available resources that will be used to meet up with the overall objective, which is the long-term objective. This strategic will now be incorporated into what is known as financial management. Financial management is a process of carrying on investment activities by minimizing the cost and maximizing the profits of an organization. The term strategic financial management aims at controlling and looking towards finances of the companies to achieve the desired targets and end the desired targets of the company. The overall objectives of a corporate entity or private organization is to earn profit at the end of their investment, which will be set out in the corporate mission and visual statements of all corporate entities and organizations. The function of strategic financial management starts from detecting the means of accruing funds that will be required for business. Then also looking for the means or ways by which this fund will be utilized on a viable project that will aim towards the overall target of a business entity, which is maximization of profits. Having defined the term strategic financial management, we are going to take a look at the wide range of financing a company, which is found in the aims of a business entity. So SFM encompasses the full range of company finances, which include the following, setting out objectives, Objectives 
which will be identified in the company's or corporate's mission and vision statements, which also is the aim at achieving the maximization of profits. This certain objective will be identified or classified as primary and other objective or secondary objectives. Part of what SFM is aiming to achieve, aside from setting out objectives, is identifying resources. As we all know from the strategic definition, identifying a long term decision and available resources to be utilized in meeting up the long term goals. Having identified resources, the other objective is to analyze data. What are the cost of action to be put in place in achieving the overall objectives? The next one is making financial decisions. In our conventional corporate reporting, after recording, after all the process of financial accounting, the end use is to make financial decision. Same is applicable to financial management. After identifying the available resources, the set objectives, utilizing in the proper investment by earning a maximum profit, there will be a decision making, financial decision making at the end of the project or investment. And lastly, monitoring performance. Performance will always be measured to determine variances, either positive variance or negative variance. And that is the purpose of monitoring a performance or measuring a performance by comparing previous achievements with current or actual performance and providing solution to improve in the current performance of the management of an organization. We move on to the strategic planning process. The strategic planning process are the steps that are taken by financial managers to meet up with the overall objectives or corporate objectives of an organization. And the steps, which include the following, we have five main strategic planning process. The first one, which is the identifying corporate objectives. The strategic planning process give the first steps of identifying corporate objectives without aims and objectives. The plan cannot be taken into action. So the first thing in a strategic financial management is identification of corporate objectives. And the major corporate objective of all private organizations, which is the maximization of profit or shareholders' wealth. We are going to discuss on this corporate objective extensively. Having identified the corporate objective, the next step is establish target for the corporate objective. There should be a target that will be set out for the corporate objectives identified. These are the target sets on each of the corporate objectives. The next step, which is the development to develop a business strategy for achieving the target sets. There will be a business strategy that will be developed by management or directors of a corporate entity to achieve the corporate objective target that is being set in the second step 
after identification of the corporate objective. And most of the business strategy that will be set to minimize the cost and maximize the profit. And this can be achieved by increasing in revenue base. Having developed a business strategy for achieving the target, the next step is to convert strategies into action plan. Strategy is a plan. But without taking action on such strategy, the overall objective of a corporate entity will not be achieved. So this will not be put into what? Into action. The strategies will be put into action. And lastly, monitoring of performance by comparing what was the set objective with the actual performance. And from there, financial decision can be taken by looking at the problems and providing adequate or strategic solution in meeting up with the corporate objective. I believe we are following. From the strategic planning process, the first step, which is the identification of what? Corporate objective. Now we want to look into the corporate objective. What are the corporate objectives of all corporate entity? These corporate objectives can be identified or categorized into two, which are primary objective and other corporate objectives. The primary corporate objectives of all corporate entities is the maximization of profit, profit maximization or shareholders' wealth. And this profit can be maximized through increase in revenue or sales and managing the cost at a minimal level, reducing cost and increasing revenue base to increase the profit level of the organization. The next one is achieving growth in earnings per shares. And this growth in earnings per shares can be achieved through the profit maximization. The more there is growth in the profit of an organization having distributes dividend to the shareholders, the more growth will be in the earnings per shares to all shareholders. These are the two primary corporate objectives. And then we have other corporate objectives. This include, please note that the other corporate objective will assist the primary objective. Without this other corporate objective, or we call it secondary corporate objective, the primary objective may not be achieved. We take a look at each of these other corporate objectives, one after the other. The first one, which is to pay staff competitive salaries. This is key because employees are part of the management that carry out the daily running of a business or corporate entity. And all the employees are working towards meeting up with the overall corporate objectives of an organization, which is profit maximization. So if these other corporate objectives are not being met, it will substantially affect the primary corporate objectives. So to pay staff competitive salaries, what are staff competitive salary? Pay staff as at when due. Their salary must be paid as at when due. By so doing, this will motivate all staff to do more, to add more impact, to bring in a new strategy that will develop the company in order to meet up with the primary corporate objectives. As we, we all know, some of corporate entities, 
they're having a paid period, a paid day. Some we have maybe 27, 28, 29. And once this date has been identified, there won't be any stories as at when due, all the staff will be having their salary immediately as at when due. With that, the primary corporate objective will also be met because all the staff will be what? Motivated, having the knowledge that every certain date of every month, their competitive salary will be what? Will be paid into their provided account. This competitive salary can be in form of the basic salary and some other benefits accrued, as it may be stated in the offer letter of all employees. The next other corporate objective, which is to invest in staff training. Staff training brought about in, in the knowledge of the business activities in which a business is operating. When a corporate organization spend more in staff training, this will also assist the primary corporate objective by maximizing the profit of the shareholders. So most corporate organizations always invest in staff training and development. The next one, which is to invest in new product development. And this can always come in form of rebranding. Or if it is a service-oriented organization, by looking at the best strategy or a new development to serve the customers to their best satisfaction. So most organizations need to invest in new product development or by adding a new product into the existing product. Is somebody having a question? All right, then lastly, to take into account the needs of the society. A business entity needs to give back to the community in which the business is operating, which is also refers to as corporate social responsibility. This will be discussed fully in this particular slide. So these are the corporate objectives of all corporate entities or private organization. We're having the primary objective and the secondary objective, or we call it other corporate objectives. And the other corporate objective will assist the achievement of the primary corporate objectives. I believe we are all following. We move on to the rules of a financial manager. Financial managers are those who are responsible for the daily running of a business organization. They maintain all the process, procedures that are set out in the corporate code of conduct of an organization. So they run the affairs of an organization on behalf of the owners or the directors. So they oversee all the activities. By so doing, they are also working towards meeting the corporate objectives of an organization. The financial managers are responsible for the financial health, that is the daily process of an organization. So they produce financial reports, direct investment activities, and develop strategies and plans for long-term financial goals of their organizations. These are the main rules and responsibilities of the financial manager. The financial manager has three key rules, while other rules will be identify out of these three major rules of the financial manager. 
The three key rules, which include the investment decision, financing decision, and dividend decision. The first among these decisions, which is the financing decision. The financial manager is concerned with sources of fund, sources of finance that will be used to run a business entity because this source of finance will be used to start up a business or to increase the base, the capital base of a company. So without financing the business, there will be what is known as investment decision and the overall corporate objectives will not be achieved. The next one, which is the investment decision. Having source for finance to carry out a business operation, the financial manager is also responsible on how to invest the finance that is being sourced either through equity or debt on a profitable project. And this is the decision that will be made by the financial manager to look into series of investments and invest in the most profitable or financially viable projects. So they look into series of investments or projects to finance the funds that has been identified. And the third decision, which is the dividend decision, you also give an advice to the management on the overall profits or the operating profits of the organization. What will be the dividend retention policy after distributing to all shareholders? So they give decision on dividend policy. So these are the three key rules of the financial manager. They also act by communicating financial policies to the shareholders, both internally or externally, both internal shareholders or external shareholders. So they communicate financial policies. Policies like we have money laundering, we have some other policies, controls in financial management. So they communicate all these financial policies to the shareholder, either internally or externally, internal shareholders or external shareholders. Another role of the financial manager is financial planning and control. They carry out financial planning and give control on all finances. And lastly, risk manager, they are involved in investment decision by carrying out a risk portfolio, identifying the risks that will be associated to some of these investments. So by so doing, they advise the management on how to diversify into various portfolio or investments in order not to fall into the victim of loss at the end of the financial year. So the three key rules, which are financing decision, investment decision, and dividend decisions, is broadly explained here. I've been identifying the sources of finance to be used in investment decision. The first thing is to identify what will be the sources of finance. And this can either be through equity or sources from the owners or debts, which is external loans, and also considering the cost that will be associated on such debts, which will be factored in into the investment decision. That is the cost of capital, the cost that is used to source for this capital will also be included as the overall capital. And this will be taken into consideration while carrying on investment decision on any project that will be profitable. So the financing decision is concerned with when, how, and where funds needed. 
So this take cognizance of the three E's, economic efficiency and effectiveness. When money is needed, where the money will be needed, and how these funds will be utilized. So it consider the sources of finance available, their costs and accessibility, while taking into consideration the mix of the debt and equity finance in the capital structure and effects on the company's leverage, that is financial risk. The next decision, the second decision, which is the investment decision. The financial manager will have to, dive, to identify series of investments, different types of projects and methods to be used in carrying out the investments appraisal. This is concerned with how the funds acquired should be utilized so as to add value to shareholders' wealth. It is mainly concerned with how long-term assets, that is capital budgeting, and short-term assets, working capital, are managed to ensure that providers of funds get their funds back and shareholders' wealth will be maximized. This fund can be, there are series of how business is being financed. We can have an equity finance, we can have asset finance, and we can also have a working capital. We can also have what is known as overdrafts, a loan or debt in forms of overdrafts. Why some of this loan can also be in form of working capital, the short-term funds that will be used for daily running of the business. And the financial manager will be aiming by ensuring that providers of funds get back their funds as at when needed and in order to maximize the shareholders' profits. The third one, which is the dividend decision. The first one, you have identified the sources of finance, how to finance a business, you have looked into the different projects that the business can embark upon. Then the third one, you need to maximize the shareholders' profit and give the management and shareholders decision on how to retain a profit after distributing dividend to all shareholders. So the dividend decision is concerned with what portion of the company's profit at the end of a period should be given as compensation to ordinary shareholders, that is dividend that will be given to shareholders, what will be the portion of the overall profits that is generated from the business operation. So it's considered the factors that govern how and when to pay dividend and their likely effects on shareholders' wealth. So this looks at the various responses or reactions that might arise as a result of non-payment of dividend based on the composition of shareholders and their preferences. I hope we are all following. Any questions so far? Can we continue? Sure, we can continue. All right. We have the shareholders and their objectives. Who are shareholders? Shareholders are those that are having interest or those that will be affected either directly or indirectly by what an organization does. Stakeholders are individuals or groups who are affected by the activities of the firm. They are classified as internal or external stakeholders. The internal stakeholders, which are employees and managers, connected stakeholders, which are shareholders, customers, suppliers, competitors, debt holders, and banks. Then the external users, which are local communities, pressure groups, we have the governments, 
professional and regulatory bodies, all these stakeholders has their expectations. What are the expectations of the internal stakeholders? And what are the expectations of the external stakeholders? So they could be classified as primary stakeholders whose participation is needed for the business continuity. And who are these primary stakeholders that are their participation is needed for business con continuity? They are the customers and the suppliers. And the secondary stakeholders who are failing to participate in the business, they are not into the daily running of a business, but they have impact at the end of the operation of the business. So failing to participate in the business has no effect on the going concern of the business. These are governments and managers. Now these are the classes of, uh, of stakeholders and their expectations. The directors and managers, the expectation is to maximize their rewards. Employees, employees' expectation is maximizing their rewards as well and continuity of employment, that is job security. We have suppliers. Suppliers are those that provide raw materials or goods that will be needed for the production or process of a business entity. And the expectation is that to be receiving full payments of good supply or services rendered as at when due. Banks, who are the financiers, they are those, they are the providers of funds to business entity. And the expectation is receiving full payments as at when due and minimizing defaults. How do they minimize defaults? Before the financial institutions or banks give a debt or loan to corporate entity, there's what is known as checks that will be carried out on such company. And the check will be if they are having previous loan portfolio and how they are able to service those portfolio. If they are performing, and they also look into the financial statements of this organization, if they are also capable of demanding or requesting for additional funds to carry on another project. So with this, they are going to carry out a risk analysis on such company by looking at how much has been the previous loan collected by this organization, what is the repayment plan, and will the financial, will the financial management, financial statements, of such organization looking into the inflows and outflows of their finances be able to cater for the new finance. So if not, most of these banks or financiers will not be giving out additional funds to corporate entities to carry on a new project. So the expectation is receiving full payments as at when due and minimizing defaults. Ordinary shareholders, the expectation is to maximize wealth as business owners. The customers, customers are those, they are the end users of products that is being produced or services that will be rendered from corporate organization. And what are the expectations of customers? They need quality products and the satisfaction in terms of goods services rendered, quality and price of the commodities. Governments, the expectation of governments at large is by looking into the regulatory framework, compliance by all corporate entities. And what are the compliance? There are corporate norms and the major Expectation of government is tax payments by corporate entities, high level of employment and sustained growth are the expectation of the government. 
We have professional and regulatory bodies. All corporate entities as their regulatory bodies. Financial institutions as their regulatory bodies. Insurance companies, they have their regulatory bodies. Professional services, they also have their regulatory bodies that maintain the rules and the code of conduct in their dealings. And what are the expectations of professional and regulatory bodies? They are to ensure strict adherence to rules and regulations and payment of dues to the regulatory bodies or professional bodies in which the business entity are operating. We move on to corporate social responsibility. Business entity or corporate organization operates in an environment. They are expected to give back to the environment in which their business is being operated. Corporate social responsibility refers to the responsibility that a company has towards society. This can be described as decision made by a business that is linked to ethical values, respect for individuals, society, and environment, all in compliance with legal requirements. And the corporate social responsibility is based on the concept that a company is a citizen of the society in which it operates. Any business entity are classified as a citizen of the community in which that business is operating. Therefore, they have the responsibility to give back to the community in which they operate. And that will be classified as corporate social responsibility. So it has two key areas of responsibility. We have the general responsibilities needed for industry success and regulatory duties and this is beyond the general responsibilities. We have the principles of the corporate social responsibilities. What are the guidelines? What are the norms that are expected from corporate organization to participate in corporate social responsibility or in the community in which they operate? There are five main aspects of CSR, corporate social responsibility. I hope I'm not too fast. The main aspect of corporate social responsibility, which include the following, a company should operate in an ethical way and with integrity. So this ethical way, or with integrity will be recognized code of ethical behavior. And don't forget that all corporate entities as their regulatory bodies, by so doing, they all have their ethical code of conduct or behavior that are expected by both this, the, uh, the employers and the employees of the organization. Employees should be treated fairly and with respect, that is employment policies, training and conditions are part of corporate social responsibility. Respect for basic human rights must also be demonstrated by corporate entity. The next one is company should be responsible citizen in its community, that is investing in local community. And how can company invest in their local community so they can be this can be in form of provision of water it can also be provision of accessible road or it can also be provision of electricity supply in the community in which they are operating and lastly company should ensure environment is sustained for future generations. And how can they sustain this? This will be in form of 
reducing air or water pollution in the Recycling of waste materials and cutting down on use of non-renewable energy resources, such as oil and coal. So companies should ensure environment is sustained for future generations. And so they are to maintain adequate environmental sanitation by reducing hair or water pollution, recycling of waste materials as at when necessary. All these are the main aspects of corporate social responsibilities. So these are the procedures, the ethical ways in which corporate entities are expected to perform at all times in the environment or community they operate. Now we are moving on to agency theory. This agency theory arises, or is an agreement that exists between two parties, where one party employ the other party to run the administration or the affairs of their organization on behalf of the owner. The owner is referred to as principal. Why the managers that are running the business on behalf of the owner is referred to as agents. Agency theory can be defined as a form of contract between company's owners and its managers, where the owners appoint an agent, the owner who are the principal, while the agent who is referred to as the managers to manage the company on their behalf. Agency conflicts arises as differences in the interest of a company's owners and managers. So whenever there is difference between the expectation of the owners and that of the owners and that of the agents, that is what is regarded as agency conflicts. And this arises in differences in the interest of the company's owners and the manager. And this can occur in the following ways. The first one, which is moral hazard. Uh, muted, Mr. Lassonji. This refers to the manager's personal interest, such as status. Management or managers are expected to be treated with high status and the most expectation of these managers will include remunerations that will be added to their portfolio. One among which is we have the car, lunch allowance, and some other benefits to their portfolio. But the expectation of the owners is to maximize the profits of the shareholders by increasing the revenue base and managing, reducing the cost involved in the process of a business entity. By so doing, the interest of the owners is conflicting with the interest of the managers because the owners may not be able to meet up with the status 
that is referred by the managers by providing all other packages to their status, cars, lunch allowance, and some other benefits that will be accrued to their portfolio. Because if the management, if the owners are putting more benefits to the manager's interest, that will be reducing their return at the end of their business operation. So this is one of the causes, the conflict that affects or that arises between the owners of a firm and the managers that are running the daily routine of the business. We have time horizon. Shareholders or owners of a business are interested in long-term objectives. Why the managers may be concerned with short-term objectives? Why? The owners of an organization are setting up a future plan which will be stated in their mission and vision statements. They will be aiming at a goal which will be achieved in a longer period of time, which are usually long-term strategic planning. Managers may not be having the intention of staying for a very long period of time because of their interest. And part of the interest, which has been identified under the moral hazard, the management, sorry, the owners may not be able to be catering for all the expectation or the interest of the managers. And with a longer period of their objectives, that will be affecting the manager's expectation. So why managers may be concerned with the short-term objectives? Because the short-term objectives will be working towards meeting up with the long-term objectives. So by so doing, the short-term objectives of each corporate organization is to maximize the profit of the owners at the end of each year. So by so doing, if the managers will be able to be meeting up and surpassing the targets, which will be the short-term objectives of the organization, that will also be benefiting to the managers. So by so doing, the managers will be interested in the short-term objectives. Why the shareholders will always be interested in their long-term objectives, which will be stated in their mission and the vision statement of their organization. We have risk aversion. Management may be a risk averse due to the stability of the company. Why the owners may want bigger risks as long as returns are high. The managers would prefer to diversify into different portfolio in order to reduce the risk that will be affecting the return of the entity, which is also working towards the, the short-term objectives. Whereas the owners are always interested in bigger risk portfolio, as long as the return will be what? Will be high, because the higher the risk on an investment, the higher the return on investment. So managers are always interested in risk diversification due to stability of the company. Why the shareholders may want a bigger risk as long as the return will be higher. The next conflict is effort level. Managers may work less hard than they would if they were the owners of the company because the long-term objective will be set by the owners of the organization. And managers are not interested in the long-term vision of an organization. By so doing, managers may work less harder than they would if they were the owners of the company. So the owners of the company will have, want the management or the managers to work harder 
in order to achieve their corporate objective, which is the maximization of the profit. And lastly, we have earnings retention. Management are more likely to want to reinvest profits in order to make the company bigger rather than pay out the profit as dividend. Most managers prefer to reinvest the profit rather than giving out this profit as dividend to the owners, to the, to the owners of equity. Because the remuneration of managers is linked to company size. As more as the company is growing, part of the agreement that may come between the managers and the owners of a business may be there will be a certain percentage of return that the managers will be earning. So these are the conflicts that may arise between the owners and managers of an organization. How can Hello, sir. Okay, I'm with you. I have a question. All right. On the effort level, uh, you said the management may have loved to work less hard if they were the owner of the business. So on that point, we are looking at the benefits the managers is also looking at because some of these uh, managers are based on a certain level of performance. If they're able yes. to achieve this level of performance, the return at the end of the year, this is what they will get. But I think they will have loved to work harder ordinarily to hand that kind of incentive at the end of the year end. So I want you to really look at that point again and less uh, because i'm not too clear on that all right part of this is that this effort level the managers may, may have identified this in their contracts there are some agreements between agents and the owners of an entity and part of this contract may be that irrespective of the return on investment there will be a certain level at which the remuneration of these managers will be fixed. By so doing, the managers will may work less other because of the fixed percentage that will be given to the managers. It may not be in form of percentage, but it may be in form of a fixed rate. For instance, let's assume that it is being given to a manager that either meeting up with the target or not, your return will be so 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 amount. By that, the manager may work less other than they would because of the contracts of agreement between the owners and the managers. Not at all. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. How can we resolve the agency conflicts that usually arise between the owners and the managers of an organization. These are the solutions to agency conflicts. The first one is profit-related pay. In carrying out this agreement, contracts, when there is an identified profit-related pay to the managers, I think all these conflicts that usually arise between the managers and the owners of a business will not be affecting the owners of the business because the managers may or will be willing to work with the intention or the prospect of the owners of a business. So there should be a, what? a profit related pay to the managers. Also remuneration scheme, when there is adequate remuneration scheme drawn out that will benefit the managers and will not affect the return to the shareholders. This will also resolve 
the agency conflicts, and this will have been incorporated in their contract of agreements. Employees' benefits. There are some other benefits that all organizations, staff, and management members are looking towards from the management or from the owners of an entity. A part of these employee benefits are some other remuneration scheme, which may be in form of pension to managers. If you look at some of these managers' agreements, for those that are in practice, we find, it, we find out that the owners of a corporate entities may not be willing to put this pension into consideration to their managers. Reason being that they tend to be paying more to that contributions than that of the employees or manager. So when there is a appropriate plan for this employment, employees benefit, all this will resolve the agency conflicts, the conflict that may arise between the managers and the owners of the business. And lastly, share option. So there can be a share option available to the managers by giving a scenario or a platform, providing a platform that the managers can also buy into the shares of a company when he or she meet up with some conditions. So with this, all this can now resolve the conflict that may be arising between the owners and the managers of an entity. We are moving on to the agency cost. The agency cost is referred to as the cost that the shareholders incurred. And when we're talking about shareholders, these are the owners incurred when professional managers were employed to run the administration of their company. And the aspect of this agency cost is they are, we have the cost of monitoring and the bonding cost. The cost of monitoring, a company will establish system for monitoring the actions and performance of management to try to ensure that manager, managements are acting in their best interest. An important example of monitoring is the requirements of the directors to present an annual report and audited accounts to the shareholders, setting out the financial performance and financial position of the company. So this is one of the functions of the managers. At the end of financial year, some organization do this every quarter. At the, first, at the end of the first three months, they prepare what is known as management reports. And this manager, management report, will, which will give a detailed analysis of all revenue and expenditure by looking into the set objectives. What are the plan? for the year, then measuring this performance with what was set as objectives. So the management we put in place, the cost of monitoring, so which is mostly on the requirement to present what annual report. So by so doing, the management can actually measure the performance of the management. The owners of an organization can easily measure the performance of the management through the annual reports by knowing if the managers are working in the interest, in the best interest of the owners. And second one, which is the cost. So these are costs incurred to provide incentives to managers to act in their best interest. So the main example of bonding costs are the cost of remuneration packages for senior executives. And the more you motivate the managers, the more they intend to work towards achieving the objectives of the owner. So these, these costs are intended to reduce the size of agency problem, which we have identified here. So this cost tends to reduce what? The identified agency problem, that is, conflict between the owners 
of a business and what and the interest of the agents. So directors and other senior management might be given incentive in form of free shares in the company, we've mentioned that, or share options, giving rooms for the, uh, for the agents to participate in shareholding of the organization. In addition, directors and semi-managers might be paid cash bonuses if the company achieves certain specific financial targets. So these are the costs that may be incurred by the owners of the business. Now we move on to treasury function. Treasury function deals with how the funds or it focuses majorly on the financing decision of a financial manager as one of the rules of a financial manager. This deals with providing fund for capital investments and ensuring three E's, three value for money, which are economic effectiveness and efficiency. The treasury function, the treasury department is responsible for making sure that cash is available in the right amount at the right time and in the right place, which are the three value for money, three E's in value for money, economic, effectiveness and efficiency. So it is the functions of the treasury department to make cash available in the right amounts, in the right time, and in the right place. So the roles of a treasury department include the following. To produce regular cash flow forecast, to predict surpluses and shortfall. They are the ones that carry out a financial projections on an investment. They give a forecast, a financial projection on investment. And to identify, to predict, either there will be a surplus or deficit on any projects that a company may want to embark upon. They arrange short-term borrowing and investments when necessary. They are the intermediary. They also serve as intermediary or what is known as intermediation between the surplus and the deficit. So they arrange the short-term borrowing and investments when necessary. They deal with entities bank. The liars with bank on behalf of the company. So they carry out projections, give a backing on finances that may be needed by an entity through their financial institutions or bank. Other functions of the treasury department is that finance, they finance the business on a day-to-day -day basis. So they provide working capital tools for daily running of a business. They advise senior managers on long-term financing requirements when the management want to carry out a long-term investment or project, they give advice on long-term financing requirement in terms of cost of the capital, the purpose of the business, or the purpose of the investment or project, and what are their expected repayments on both principal repayments and the interest repayments. How and how this will not affect the corporate objectives of such entity. They also give advice on foreign exchange transactions. They look at local and foreign currency fluctuations. So they give advice when necessary, 
can a business move into any of these foreign currency transaction because of the foreign exchange differences? And lastly, they are the risk management, such as foreign exchange or currency risks, interest risks, credit risks or market risks. Lastly, we'll be looking into ethical issues in financial management. When we are talking about ethical issue, these are the norms, the procedures, the standard, the culture of an organization. We've discussed part of this culture or norms in why we, when we started this lecture, part of which is a regulatory bodies, which are also part of the stakeholders of an organization. They have their rules and regulations that are governing the procedure and process of an organization in different entities. While individual corporate organizations, we also have their ethical ways and procedures to be followed, which they expect all their staff and management to follow suit. Now we are going to start with business ethics. In pursuing profit and shareholders' wealth maximization, companies should act ethically. And in giving advice on financial, to financial managers, the financial manager should be conscious of any ethical issue. And this is part of the risk that the treasury department also look into. So the financial manager should consider or be conscious of any ethical issues that might be involved in the matter. So business ethics cover aspects of business behavior, such as the following. All these business ethics, are mostly general ethics that all corporate entities are expected to abide by. The first one, which is honesty and integrity in business dealings with others. That is, corporate entities should work in an ethical way without any bias. So honesty is more than just remaining within the law. Another business ethics, or behavior which is concerned for other stakeholders, such as employees, suppliers, and customers. All business entities should also have the concern of others, like employees. And part of this concern for other stakeholders, as one of the employees, is by paying staff competitive salary as at when due, not that previous salary. Previous month salary will be paid in the next month. And even if it is paid in the, in the following month, it should be on, an, on the early period of the following month. Not that you'll be paying January salary on the 15th of February. So companies should all, always cons, have concern for other stakeholders like employees. And how can they do that? By giving staff competitive salary, giving staff training, and some other benefits to employees to motivate them. Suppliers, paying suppliers for their goods supplied or services rendered. And concern for the other stakeholders like customers by providing quality services and providing good standard to the consumers. And lastly, by considering the price mechanism to be put in place. Another business ethics is respect for human rights. This might involve avoiding business dealings with unethical suppliers or supply goods who use child labor or slave labor. So there should always be a respect for human rights. And we have seen a lot of scenario whereby we're having a slave labor, whereby somebody will be contracted to a third party and the third party will not be having access to the remuneration. 
the other business entities which is concerned for the environment. And how can you concern for the environment? They need to reduce or avoid pollution. So don't make use of your production process to affect the environment in which the business is operating. So to reduce or avoid pollution and the need to develop a sustainable environment, a sustainable business environment. Recognition by large companies of the social responsibilities to the communities in which they exist. So by so doing, creation of uh, what is it called? Medical facility in the local community, accessible roads and water. We move on to the corporate codes of ethics. The corporate code of ethics is a code of ethical behavior issued by the board of directors of a company. And this has always been the practice of most corporate entities. The decisions and actions of all employees in the company must be guided by the code of corporate ethics. So the effectiveness of a code of ethics will depend on the leadership of the company, its directors and senior managers. Individuals must be seen to with ethical code or other employees will see no purpose in complying with the codes of ethics. And what are the reasons for corporate code of ethics? We're having a series of reasons. The reason why there will be a need to identify or to determine the code of ethics to all corporate entities. It has been suggested that there are three reasons. Why companies might develop a code of ethics. These reasons are progressing. So which means that companies might begin by having a code of ethics for first reason, but then progress to the second and third reason as they gain experience with implementing the code and appreciating its potential benefits. Now the reasons for corporate code of ethics are classified below. We have managing for compliance. The company wants to, if company wants to ensure that all its employees comply with relevant laws and regulations and conduct themselves in a way that the public expects, there must be a compliance by such corporate entities. Example of this management, managing for compliance is that company providing a service to the general public need to ensure that their employees are polite and well-behaved in their dealings with customers. So most of corporate entities also discover this and train all their staff to comply, to comply with what? Major compliance in their code of ethics. Another one, which is managing stakeholders' relations. A code of ethics can help to improve and develop the, relations, the relationship between the companies and its shareholders. So by improving the trust that shareholders have in the company, and what are the trust that the shareholders will be having in their company, it will be based on the expectations of individual stakeholders or shareholders. And all these expectations are expected to be met by all corporate entities. So this is the second reason for corporate code of ethics. The third one is creating a value-based organization. 
a company might recognize the long-term benefits of creating an ethical culture and encouraging employees to act and think in a way that is consistent with the values in its code of ethics. And this value-based organization that is expected by all the employees of an organization will have been incorporated in the corporate code of ethics. By the time individual and individual employees are employed into an organization, they are to affirm to the corporate code of ethics of the organization at all times. It will be argued that an ethical company, like a well-governed company, is more likely to be successful in business in the long term because they are monitoring the corporate code of ethics that is being laid down to all their employees. Now we move on to the contents of a corporate code of ethics. There is no standard format or content for code of ethics. Individual organization can create their code of ethics. And on individual code of ethics, there will still be some other general codes that will be expected by all organizations to have also complied with. And this will also be stated in individual corporate code of ethics. But a typical code must contain general statements about ethical conduct by employees and specific reference to the company's dealing. So we have the general statement about ethical conduct by employees, and this is an affirmation at all times to the corporate code of ethics. And we also have the specific reference to the company's dealing with each other group, such as employees, customers, shareholders, and local community. The specific reference to the companies dealing with each other stakeholders group. We have such as employees, we have customers, shareholders, and local communities. And the expectations are acting all times with integrity, protecting the environment, the pursuits of excellence and respect for the individuals. Generally, a code of conduct might address its main concern about its dealings with stakeholders group and its ethical treatment of each group. It may not necessarily be as it was stated here that there is no standard format, that all these code of conduct must be the same thing in all corporate entities. There can be an amendment to the, this identified stakeholders and their code of expected code of conduct. The first among the stakeholders, which is the employee, 
A code of ethics might include statements about human rights, including the right of all employees to join legally, authorized organization such as union or political party. So this code of conduct will have in its own statement that will include the right of all employees to join legally without any sentiment of tribes or some any other sentiment among the individuals. Another one is equal opportunities for all employees, regardless of gender, race, ethnic origin, religion, age, disability, or sexual orientation. Another one which is refusal to tolerate harassment of employees by colleagues or managers. Most corporate organizations always act in this ethical manner by tolerating each other. And part of this tolerance, which may be scolding or giving a sanction to any of the employees that are working or that are acting against the corporate code of ethics. Concern for the health and safety of employees will also be part of what will be identified in corporate code of ethics. There will be a concern for the health and safety of all employees. And the terms and conditions on healthy and safety tips will also be included on the code of conduct for employees. The next one is respect for the privacy of confidential information about each employee. 100% of all corporate entities, all corporate entities give an orientation to their employees regarding the confidentiality of information of their customers by not divulging any of the information to third party. And lastly, company policy on giving or receiving entertainment or bribes. We have seen these cases whereby there are some companies that have their policy on bribes, receiving, receiving gifts or donation or bribes from, uh, from, from individuals or from their customers. Why there are some companies that are having threshold limits to, to benefits that will be received from their employees, uh, from their customers to their employees. And all these are expected to be followed by the employees of organization based on the lay down code of conduct of their organization. Customers, a code of ethics might include statements about the fair dealing with customers, product safety and or product quality, and we have the faithfulness, the truthfulness of advertisements. So a code of ethics might include for the customers the following, fair dealings with customers, product safety and or product quality, and the truthfulness of advertisements. And lastly, respect for the privacy of confidential information about each customers. We have the code of conduct for competitors. So a code of ethics, for competitors might include statements about fair dealing with competitors and the use 
of techniques for obtaining information about competitors. Uh, mostly these are industrial spying or what is known as benchmarking. Hello, sir. Hello, I'm with you. Question. Okay. Yeah, on the competitors, we talk about fair dealings with the competitors. Can you please explain further because it's not too so clear. All right. Under these fair dealings, when you are carrying out a benchmarking on competitors, there are limits to what you need to know about your competitors. This can be in form of when you are having a relationship with your competitors and your competitors might not know that you are there, you are competing with their products or services. Once the competitor perceives this, either from the questions you are having or either from other information that you are trying to generate from their platform, so immediately, the competitor request or stop your intro into such information. So you must obey the competitors by going for that to look out for other means to benchmark the competitors. Is that clear? Not, not really. Okay, now. In essence, we we are looking at um, getting because most of the benchmarking we are doing basically is not something you just get um, get right. on guessing. You have to be based on the facts and in documents of the organization itself. So if you are actually going to have a, a competition with your uh, in, in a sector, then you should be able to get those details. If not, then you will not be able to have your own production and have a, a good competition or to survive in that industry. I understand where you are coming out from. And you understand that when you are carrying out your benchmarking, you carry out your benchmarking without the knowledge of your competitors. I believe, I believe you understand that. Yes. And by so doing, you may even have access to your competitors without showing your identity. Is that not possible to? That, that, that's the point. All right. So by so doing, you know, being a business-oriented person and having the knowledge, full knowledge about a business, once you are having interaction with competitors, there will be a certain level at which you are going to identify such question about to be a competitor. Hmm. Are you with me? Yes, yes. Now, from there, if the competitor paint or stop other questioning from you, even without identifying you physically to be their competitor, so you have to ascertain what is known as fair dealing. I don't have any other information that I want to provide to you. So you okay. will not give in be, being on insist to get such information from that competitors because you are trying to breach the code of conduct reason being that if further questioning proceed by that so the competitor will also have the privilege to find out if oh. you are cheaters and that you are violating the rules of the competition not it correct all right. Thank now you. we have the shareholders. You're welcome. A code of ethics might not include much about shareholders because the relationship between the company's owners and the shareholders, and the managers and the shareholders, might be contained in the code of corporate governance that the company will follow. And on the corporate code of conduct, of all organization, 
at the first introduction level and some other hints about the corporate governance and code of ethics, there will be a portion that will state the managing the board of directors of the organization and the mission and statements of each of these directors or board of management on this code of ethics and all their expectations will be also be part of their speech or notes to the code of conduct and they too also have a guideline on how to maintain and also work in hands by ensuring the code of conduct is being implemented all the code of conduct must also be followed by the owners and the managers of the company so the key issue with shareholders is to maintain and develop trust and confidence which can be achieved through the disclosure of information that is openness and transparency any questions so far so this brings to the end of our discussion today i'm having a practice question for us all and I will urge every one of us to try and make an attempt on this question. Send this, send your profile solution to me individually. Then I will respond by giving a correction if necessary. But if we are if we are correct, I'm going to comment on individual submission. Why the financial plans? of a business are based on a single objective. It can be faced, it can face a number of constraints that put pressure on the company to address more than one objective simultaneously. The requirement is that what type of constraints might a company face when assessing its long-term plans? Also specifically refer in your answer to responding to various stakeholders groups and the difficulties associated with managing organizations with multiple objectives. The second question, divide corporate social responsibilities and state their principles. B, how can a company resolve conflict of interest between owners and managers as regard corporate social responsibility? And the third question, in relation to agency theory, divide the term agency cost and explain three aspects of agency cost. Thank you all for your time. See you in the next class. Any questions so far? So uh, will the material be sent? The material is supposed to have been shared before now. I think the admin has shared this material. But if we chat with we will get it. Mr. Yes. Your question. Your question, Mr. Skinsley. Okay. Good afternoon. It was the same question I wanted to ask whether the question so far will be shared, but yeah, that's true. Okay, yes, it will be shared. All right. Thank you all for your time. Okay, Mr. Biodo, your question, please. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, the material was shared, but it appears that the one you use for this class, it has okay. is more complete than the one I got. Okay. Okay. The one I got, it stops at um it stopped around agents after agency. That that should be it has, treasury. It has to against advantages of centralized treasury management. Now that's where it stopped. Okay, okay, all right, I get you. So all these ethical issues in financial management was not there? They are not there, yes. Don't worry, you will get this updated one. All right, thank you.
All right. So thank you all for your time. See you in the next class. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you.